Welcome back everyone, this is your girl Empowered Muse, and today we're going to do a quick recap of the Kingdom Hearts Key Saga for those who may not have been able to play through or watch the cutscenes of the mobile games. So the Key Saga in Kingdom Hearts consists of mainly Kingdom Hearts Key, which was really Kingdom Hearts Unchained Key for the mobile release, later updated to Kingdom Hearts Union Cross, Kingdom Hearts Key Back Cover, HD Cinematic, and Kingdom Hearts Dark Road. So for the purpose of retellings, the story will mainly pull from Unchained Key, Key Back Cover, Union Cross, and Dark Road. So the Key Saga in Kingdom Hearts started with the story of Unchained Key and Key Back Cover, which took place in Daybreak Town during the Age of Fairy Tales, long ago where we first meet a cloaked Keyblade wielder called the Master of Masters, where the Master meets with and bequeaths certain roles for his apprentices, Lushu, Ira, Asid, Envy, Gula, and Ava. For Lushu, the Master bequeathed the Keyblade No Name, providing him his role to continue on into the future with No Name, passing it down through a chain of apprentices in order to relay future events back to the Master via the Gazing Eye, though he do so without a copy of the Book of Prophecies in order to avoid temporal paradoxes. Additionally, Lushu would be taking the Black Box, though he is explicitly barred from opening it, though the Master does indulge Lushu's curiosity and tell him what lies within, but we as the audience are kept from knowing. But we'll get back to the Master and Master and Lushu's conversation in a minute. After Lushu leaves to fulfill his role, the Master assigns the rest of the foretellers with their own individual roles. Asa is to become Ira's right hand man where, when Ira takes over as leader. Envy is tasked to observe her fellow foretellers and act as a mediator. Gula is assigned to discern the identity of the traitor mentioned in the Lost Page and stop them. And Ava is instructed to avoid the imminent battles in favor of gathering exceptional Keyblade wielders, regardless of their unions, to be a part of a separate faction called the Dandelions who would venture to another world to ensure the survival of light. The Master also provides Ava with a list of five Keyblade wielders she must gather to succeed the Foretellers following the Keyblade War, with only one of them meant to receive a copy of the Book of Prophecies, which we saw in Kingdom Hearts Union Cross, the five chosen Keyblade wielders, Ephemer, Skuld, Brain, Lorium, and Ventus. Then without warning, the Master disappears from the world to wait for his plan to unfold. Ava and Gula actively seek him out, but are unable to locate him, but shortly after he leaves, distrust is sown among the foretellers when a dark charity appears in Daybreak Town, signaling that one of the foretellers must have fallen to darkness and turned traitor. The foretellers begin to treat each other with suspicion and even begin to consider forming alliances against each other, despite alliances being against the Master's instructions. It's at this point that Player, the main character of Unchained Key and Union Cross, along with their charity, meets Ephemer and Skull. And player, Charity, and Skull attempt to explore the Foreteller's chamber where they get caught by a Foreteller. They're told that Ephemer is a traitor to his union and has disappeared. Player then challenges the Foreteller to a duel, assuming Ephemer has been captured, but is no match. Afterward, the Foreteller is revealed to be Foreteller Ava, and that player's quest was a test of their character to see if they are worthy of joining the Dead Alliance and going on to the Realm of Light to avoid the impending Keyblade War. Skull accepts the offer, but player remains uncertain if they should join Ephemer, who has gone on to the Realm of Light, or stay and fight to save the future. Player is forced to fight for Jela Osset, who defeats him with ease. When Ira arrives to stop the fighting, Osset claims that he's collecting more Keyblade warriors to prepare for the upcoming war before he departs. Ira tells player, Skull, and Charity that the war cannot be avoided, and tasks the trio to search for the Fork Teller Gula, who may know of a solution to avert the war. When Gula is found, he reveals that the only one who could stop the Keyblade War is the Master of Masters, who had disappeared along with the Sixth Apprentice, Lushu. We then see Alva tracking down Lushu at the outskirts of Daybreak Town and interrogating him. Lushu explained that he was assigned to survive the Keyblade War and observe the events to come, and that her attempts to prevent the war by locating the Master are futile. He tells her that the Lost Page is an additional part of the prophecy that was kept secret from the Foretellers, making Alva wonder if all the conflict had simply been according to the Master's plans. They accuse Lushu of being the traitor, and Lushu then reveals the truth of the traitor, which we can only assume that Lushu told Alva that he himself was a traitor, as we see the reveal in a later scene in Kingdom Hearts Union Cross. Lushu wondered aloud if the Master had chose to take an interest in the fate of his disciples over the fate of the world, but Alva refused to accept that the Master's motives could be suspect and accused Lushu of exploiting the Master's will. He attacked Lushu and started the beginning of the Keyblade War as Daybreak Town's bell began to toll. Shortly afterward, she arrived in the Badlands with the members of her union, and the last interaction we have with Ava is when she tells Player that there are secrets Player must never know. Ava instructs Player to flee with the Dandelions while departing to continue her fated role in the Keyblade War. Player battles all the Foretellers and despite their abilities to survive, the wounds they suffer made them collapse in exhaustion. The war ends with numerous Keyblades planted in the ground, forming the Keyblade Graveyard. And on the brink of death, Player loses consciousness as Charity, Skuld, and Ephemer approach them. After being saved by Ephemer and Skuld following the conclusion of the Keyblade War, Player is brought to another realm 
for the Data Alliance have a simple as per Alvar's instructions. Upon entering this new realm, everyone loses all their memories of their previous world, with the exception of the five wielders chosen to become the new Union leaders. Following Alvar's orders, Uppermost Skull, Ventus, Brain, and Lorium gather at the Keyblade Graveyard to meet with their fellow Union leaders, with Lorium being the last to arrive. Together, the five enter the Foretellers' Chamber at Daybreak Town, where Brain looks through a copy of the Book of Prophecies that he finds. A short time before the new Union leaders met, we meet a girl named Strelitzia. A member of the Dandelion selected to be one of the new Union leaders once the war ends, who attempted to convince Blair to join the Dandelions. However, she is struck down by an unknown individual, who then steals her rule book and takes her place as the Union leader. Days after her disappearance, her brother Lorium investigates her whereabouts, aided by his fellow party member Elrena. Meanwhile, glitches begin appearing in Daybreak Town. With player's help, Brain discovers the glitches are an effect of the datascape being forcibly connected to a data world that was never connected to the original Daybreak Town. While searching for the Book of Prophecies for a solution, Brain finds the Master's List and discovers that Ventus is not one of the intended Union leaders. Suspecting that Ventus was manipulated into replacing Strelitzia, it turns out Ventus is the one responsible for Strelitzia's demise, having been manipulated by Rule for Darkness, who was disguised as Ava, into doing so. Lorian returns to the tower and gets into a heated fight with the others when he mistakenly assumes that they had something to do with Strelitzia's death. Then Ventus reveals that it was he who killed Strelitzia before Darkness emerges from him and reveals itself to the others. Darkness claims that it inhabited Ventus because such was written in the Book of Prophecies, and that Darkness and the Master of Masters were old friends. Brain asks why there is a need to hide inside Ventus. The Darkness again cites the Book of Prophecies, but then changes the story. While Darkness is many, in order to be one, it needs a will. By taking hold of Ventus, Darkness could split into his pure darkness and pure light, willful and distinct. Loyum awakens and realizes it was Darkness rather than Ventus who killed Strelitzia. Darkness then stated that Daybreak Town will still succumb to Darkness regardless. The lifeboats were meant to be the last line of defense if Darkness cannot be defeated. Once a pod is used, the battle world began a process to seal itself, ideally trapping darkness inside it, and added that it could not be destroyed as it had no form. In the real daybreak town, darkness attempts to check the computer in the lifeboat room, only to be interrupted by Lushu, who walks in holding a figure wrapped in white. He states that the Master of Masters told him to be there, and he opens up one of the pods. He places the white wrapped figure in a pod, calling it a seed of light to be planted in the future, the true dandelion which we see in another scene is actually Strelitzia. In another scene, the Darkness asks the Master about his intentions for Daybreak Town, who reveals that his plans will result in the town's ultimate destruction. The Master further explains that the Book of Prophecies only depicts selected events and he intends to use it as his waypoint, while the Gazing Eye and Lucius' memories act as his medium, giving him direct access to any destination in time. Furthermore, he intends to travel through time with seven lights on the lifeboat. In an attempt to get through the darkness, the Master reveals that he'd seen a world which he cannot conceive, hoping to expand the world by rewriting the Book of Prophecies. When Darkness wonders which world the Master could disappear to, the Master teases that it is a world where neither light nor darkness can be controlled. In the lifeboat room, Darkness questions why Lushu follows the Master Masters, to which he says he's not sure, but he is sure that the Master does not like darkness. Lushu asks Darkness, Darkness for its plan, which is to accompany the Chosen One into the future so that it can lay claim to worlds not yet created. Lucio summons his Keyblade and explains what he knows of Darkness's circumstances, that it formed when the Master of Masters was young, but then gave up that form to defeat Light, making Darkness become a whole. But Darkness's will could not be maintained in this state, meaning Darkness still needed a physical form, which requires infecting people who have hearts. Further, six darknesses with individual will currently exist. The one with Lushu entered the real world alongside Maleficent, while the remaining five are still in the data world. The Union leaders, Player and Elrena, enter the data lifeboat room where they find five pods unused and one pod broken. Since the group number seven, there is a struggle to decide who should take the available pods. Ultimately, Loyum, Ventus, Elrena, and Brain each take one. Before Brain departs, he gives the Keyblade in the Book of Prophecies to Ephemer, stating they were always meant for Ephemer to have. After everyone has said their farewells, Ephemer goes to the computer and sends the four Occupy pods to the real world, leaving only one pod unused. In a series of flashbacks throughout the adventure, we got to see a larger part of the Master of Masters conversation with Lushu. So before the Master bequeaths a no-name Keyblade with his gazing eye in the black box, he takes Lushu aside, wherein he reveals the truth of the Keyblade War and the existence of darkness as an entity to his apprentice. He informs Lushu that he plots to have Ava gather their wielders with a particular aversion to darkness travel to the world outside where they gather light from the scattered worlds to rebuild the one destroyed by the Keyblade War. Concerned, Lushu asks about these wielders, with the Master admitting that not all of them will be able to return to the real world. The Master explains that there is a way to defeat darkness, however, it's complex and would take several lifetimes to realize. Intrigued, Lushu asks if the Master had ever spoken to darkness, and the Master admits that he had though neither of them got through to the other due to their unconventional views. 
Additionally, the master reveals that Darkness is constantly observing them, but wouldn't approach them needlessly. As Lucio is still worried for the dandelions, the master allows him to watch over the dandelions so long as he doesn't interfere. After the master gives Lucio instructions with a no meaning keyblade in the black box, he explains that when the lifeboat departs, the world will end and those left behind will sink into slumber. The master stated that darkness has cast away its form in order to attack people's hearts, but in doing so, its will begins to fade. Coming clean, the master admits that there are 13 darknesses and that they could be destroyed once they attain physical form which is why he had raised his apprentices so that their hearts could be strong enough to lock away the seven strongest iterations of darkness, while five of the remaining six would be locked within the Union leaders, leaving the last to be caged within Data Daybreak Town. Lucius is unable to accept their roles and sacrifices and follows his own path, ultimately becoming the traitor referenced earlier on. In the real world, Brain searches for ways to save more people from the Data world by sending two pods from the real world to the Data world. He reasons that he can save Ephraimus Gold and Player, but first he sends Elrena, Lorium, and Ventus to the future to ensure their safety. Just as he does so, a tremor shakes the building and Lucius enters the room. Lucio introduces himself and asks Brain what his plan is. Brain responds with the two pods plan and further states that he would try to awaken as many dandelions as possible from the data world once it falls to darkness and sleep. Lucio counters that the data world is specifically designed as a cage to trap darkness and as such, the data world cannot sleep. Anyone left behind in it will be lost. He also informs Brain that the lifeboats need a medium as well as memories of the passenger at the destination in order for their body to be reconstructed. Lucia commends Brain's bravery and laments that Brain only had one lifetime. In the data world, Ephemer, Golden Player ponder whether the others are safe before they're approached by four darknesses. Ephemer tells Player to take a lifeboat, but this player's disposition suddenly changes. Player's heart had already been consumed by darkness, and Ephemer would have made a grave error by allowing Player to escape. The possessed player proposes to return the body in exchange for a gate. Ephemer once again refuses. Player and the four darknesses defeat Ephemer and Skull, and Player holds their keyblade above Skull, preparing to end her life. In desperation, Ephemer fires a beam from his keyblade that pierces Player's chest, forming a portal behind them that pulls in Player and the four darknesses in one fell swoop. And suddenly, the two pods that Brain sent appear, and Skull and Ephemer each get inside one. Ephemer and Skull arrive in the real world and witness they break down, crumbling into the darkness. The two re-enter the pods and Skull begins to weep for the lost world. He thanks Ephemer for keeping her company at the end, but he reassures her that it is not the end. Ephemer briefly reminisces about Player and sheds a tear before the pods close and the building collapses around them. In a data cable, Player lies wounded on the ground surrounded by the four darknesses. Player reveals that they were never taken over by the darkness, it was all in that. The darknesses rage and rampage about the room, unable to escape. Player collapses in exhaustion and embraces their charity before the pair are enveloped in a white light. Player finds themselves in a white void alongside numerous other Keyblade wielders. Each one transforms into their heart, which their th Charity then takes hold of, and each Charity heart pair transforms into a Dream Eater. Charity explains that they are connected to their wielders. If the wielder's heart disappears, then the Charity disappears. If the wielder falls asleep, the Charity becomes their guardian as they sleep. However, Player has a choice to not sleep if they wish. The scene fades to an unknown town where a black-haired woman hands infant Xehanort to a blue robe figure holding a walking stick. The figure brings Xehanort to the Destiny Islands, watches over Xehanort from a distance as he grows up, and then collapses once Xehanort walks towards the sea. Xehanort awakens in Scarlet at Kylum and joins the young Ericus in their chess game on the windowsill. The scene returns to the player, who chooses not to sleep. They embrace their charity one last time, and the pair transforms into a heart which floats away. The end of Epilogue of Union Cross shows the following. In the flooded ruins of Daybreak Town, a single lifeboat pod floats them on the wreckage. It finally stops on a piece of rubble, opens, and Ephemer emerges. Maleficent's Raven brings her empty robe to the mysterious tower, where Maleficent's time travel is completed, using her robe as a medium, as well as the memories from Flora, Fauna, and Merriweather. Lorian awakens in a field of flowers in the Dwarf Woodlands. Lorian remains unconscious in the dark mountainous area of Enchanted Dominion as a thunderstorm rages overhead. Ventus is unconscious in the Keyblade Graveyard and is approached by an unknown figure, and Lucio drags the black box as he walks through the Keyblade Graveyard and removes his hood, revealing the face of Brain. And Brain awakens in an unknown town, the same as the one with the black-haired woman. A hooded man walks over and seems to already know who Brain is before handing over Brain's hat. The man introduces himself as Sigurd and makes a report by holding a hand to his ear. Sigurd states that it was decided Brain would escape Daybreak Town's destruction to appear in this time and location and be welcomed by Sigurd's group. The pair walk to the square with the fountain, and Brain immediately recognizes the statue up top. Sigurd explains that this is the original Keylight Master and founder of this town, Scarlet at Kylum, Master Ephemer, wielding the Master's Defender. Brain responds that he knows and that Ephemer was a good friend. So around the moment that player is making the decision not to sleep, where we see the scenes of infant Xehanort growing up to be a young Xehanort is when the story of Kingdom Hearts Dark Road begins. 
which is basically the story that chronicles a young Xehanort's experiences and what set the path for him to later become the Dark Seeker that we know later in the Kingdom Hearts series. So Kingdom Hearts Dark Road starts out with Xehanort living on Destiny Islands, the same islands that Sora, Riku, and Kairi later call home. As Xehanort grows up on the islands, he begins to contemplate the existence of other worlds outside his home as he has multiple dreams of these worlds. When one day he's greeted by a mysterious brown hooded figure who's actually Ansem, his heartless from the future, who tells him it's his destiny to travel to other worlds. Ansem then opens a portal to Scala at Kylum, a world where Keyblade wielders train and instructs Xehanort to travel there, and Xehanort travels through a sea of literal darkness with all of these feelings of hate, fear, and trepidation somehow not only surrounded him but seemed to be directed at him. Sometime later, Xehanort, now a Keyblade wielder, and his classmates Ericus, Erd, Bregi, Vor, and Hermit are told by their instructor, Master Odin, that seven upperclassmen have gone missing before the Mark Mastery exam, including Balder's sister. Odin tasks the class to find the missing seven by scouring the many worlds. The group first traveled to Agrabah, only to find the world uninhabited yet full of Heartless. Xehanort suspects the world is still growing and has not developed living beings yet. They next go to Wonderland, where they find the world has some inhabitants, including the Queen of Hearts, who appears to have darkness in her heart. After experiencing the Queen's darkness, Xehanort and the rest of the class begin to deduce their own theories about the nature of darkness and suspect that they had something to do with the darkness appearing themselves by stating that a single light can cast countless shadows. The rest of the group refuted such sentiments, with Erica stating that darkness is bad and always has been. While Xehanort replied that it was a matter of perspective. Four years later, Xehanort has just put fresh flowers on four gravestones before saying his goodbyes to Ericus, stating he's going off on his own to see what Odin has not shown them. While Ericus is against the idea and tries to remind him that what happened wasn't his fault, he doesn't stop him, knowing that he'll be back since they need to settle the score for their games. Xehanort then returns to Wonderland to find that the Queen of Hearts, who had forgotten him during his last visit, is still possessed by darkness as he awaits his trial. Sometime later, Xehanort finds himself traveling through the corridor of darkness, where the darkness begins to slowly infect his heart. When the Dark Road finale begins, we see Xehanort and Ericus playing their chess game one year before and discussing the Keyblade War, with Xehanort pondering what the Lost Masters intended to do with Kingdom Hearts, reciting the infamous line, On that land shall darkness prevail and light expire. Ericus disagrees and states that maybe light could prevail, was Xehanort rebutting that fate has already been written. In present day, Xehanort's classmates arrive in the world of Snow White, with Vora being lost and wandering into the evil queen's castle, where she sees the queen using the magic mirror and then follows to have her own conversation with the magic mirror, asking if she'll ever become a Keyblade Master. After talking with the mirror, Vora rejoins with Xehanort and Ericus and told them what she's found and leads them back to the queen's castle, where they try to ask the magic mirror where the missing upperclassmen are, with the mirror implying that the upperclassmen were on their own, before being caught by the evil queen, who poisoned the mirror with a potion and ordered it to consume the trio. After defeating the mirror, Vidar, one of the upperclassmen, appears and says to Xehanort that there is something different about him, seeing why he caught the master's eye. Then turned to Vor and offered for her to join him and the other upperclassmen, after seeing that she was wondering whether she should stay with her friends. In her previous conversation with the mirror, Vor realized that if she stayed stagnant, she'd never become a Keyblade Master, at least according to the mirror, and with that, Vor joins Vidar and leaves Ericus and Xehanort. In a flash forward 64 years later, we see the elder master Xehanort approach the magic mirror once again, asking if it remembered him and where his friends from his dreams are, the dreams he had of the Keyblade Wilders of Union Cross, since he looked all over and couldn't find them. The mirror replies that his heart spoke more clearly than his words and that a boy of great light and darkness was amongst an ocean of keys on a vast barren land, that boy being Ventus. With that, Xehanort sets out to the Keyblade graveyard. We find another flash forward 54 years later, with the Elder Master Xehanort and Ericus talking about Xehanort's plan to forge the Keyblade and summon another Keyblade war with Ericus asking why Xehanort would consider blanketing the world with darkness, with Xehanort replying that a precious light could be found by starting the world anew in darkness because creation can spawn from ruin. Ericus replies that he would not allow this and attempts to stop Xehanort, but Xehanort strikes him with the no-name Keyblade with the power brimmed in darkness. Ericus recalls a very similar argument with Xehanort seven years after the main story of Dark Road, after they first became Keyblade Masters, with Xehanort determined to summon the Kingdom Hearts and Ericus trying to talk him out of it before they clash in the halls of Scala at Kylum. In the present day, the class returns and discusses what next moves to take with Ericus and Bregi deciding to return to the Magic Mirror to ask about Vor, and with Xehanort, Erd, and Hermit continuing ahead and traveling to the world of Beauty and the Beast, where they find the Beast Rose stolen by some of the upperclassmen, who later returned it after explaining the Rose was essential to the world's order, but not giving an explanation as to why they stole it in the first place. In a separate scene, we find Master Odin speaking with Vidar and warning him to be vigilant as darkness like no other may soon be upon them, aka true darkness, 
referring to the well for darknesses. In a flash forward of one year later, we see Xehanort traveling again in the dark corridor, this time as part of his market mastery exam, and recalling the events of the past year, all experiencing even deeper turbulent emotions within, and wondering if they've always been there or were exacerbated from the past year. As he ponders, Xehanort begins to collapse, but is almost immediately discovered by the Master of Masters, who called him a singularity. Xehanort wakes up in the Keyblade Graveyard, with the Master of Masters hovering over him, where their memorable conversation took place. The same conversation we saw in parts of Kingdom Hearts 3 Remind. We do see the beginnings of the conversation take place, where the Master of Masters introduces himself as someone who used to be a Keyblade wielder, more or less, and provides Xehanort with the Black Coat for protection in the Dark Corridor with the favor for Xehanort to take a peek into people's hearts as he traveled. The scene continues as we saw in Remind, with Xehanort returning and the Master of Masters formally introducing himself though he still did not get his name. In present day, we find Xehanort, Erd, and Hermit traveling back to Agrabah, where they run into Jafar, who asks them to retrieve a magic lamp from the Cave of Wonders, with Xehanort sensing something suspicious from Jafar as he shook his hand. The group ventures inside the Cave of Wonders, where they spot Ericus venturing further inside, and rush to follow him into the treasure room, where they stop Ericus and Bragi and discuss how Xehanort sensed darkness in Jafar, and how desperate he was to get his hands on the lamp. Earth then explains how the upperclassmen were taking items essential to the world's order, and the group believes that they were after the lamp next. They travel deeper into the cave where they find not only the lamp, but Vidar, who comes to take the lamp and explains that by stealing the items, they're hoping to find a true light that was shining even in chaos and uncertainty. Ericus then asks at what cost should they try to defeat the darkness, with Vidar relenting and explaining that they want the same thing, to defeat the darkness that took their other classmates. Ericus admits that he's not sure at what cost he'd be willing to defeat the darkness, with Xehanort replying that one day as a Keyblade Master, he may have to make that tough decision. The group heads back to tell Master Odin everything they learned so far. We then see a flash forward of 65 years from the main events of Dark Road, which is actually one year after Xehanort approached the Magic Mirror. In this scene, Xehanort is leading a broken Ventus through the dark corridors and recalling his first mentor, the one in the blue robe, teaching him that the one chosen to be a dark vessel can connect their heart to others and feel what they feel which we'll circle back to a little later. Master Xehanort then arrives at the land of departure to leave Ventus with Master Ericus, much like the scene we saw in Birth by Sleep. In a private conversation, Xehanort confides to Ericus that Ventus may be the one, and that he deserved to be guided by a true heir to light, as he, Xehanort, stood too close to darkness before they were interrupted by Ventus' screams. Renius waits for Master Xehanort in the halls of Master Ericus' school, and ask about Ventus. Xehanort recalls the story of the 13 darknesses and implies Phineas may be the physical form of one of the 13 darknesses. This he hid within Ventus and wasn't born from Ventus's heart. Back in the present day, the class returned to Master Odin to tell him everything they learned about Vidar and the other upperclassmen's plans, as well as Vor siding with Vidar and Master Odin begins to discuss the essence of true darkness with the class as he recalls his earlier conversation with Vidar regarding how true darkness can be defeated if it takes a physical vessel also reminding Vidar that summoning Kingdom Hearts to purge the worlds was an alternate option but forbidden. Master Odin then dismisses the class and laments that the Dark Seeker will finally be upon them. As a group reconvenes to outside to figure out their options, Balder appears and shares with the group that his sister Holder perished trying to protect him from Maleficent in the darkness and that he was in the infirmary and afterwards was traveling to learn more about the darknesses. Balder mentions that they could get answers in the underworld. After the group arrives at the Colosseum, they meet Hades, who enlists them in a tournament with the bargain that if they win, they can go to the underworld. However, in the underworld, only half the group arrives in Hades' chamber, as Balder, Erd, and Hermit disappear. Xehanort asks for them to speak to Holder, and Hades bargains again that if he's able to find him, one of them will have to stay behind. Xehanort and Ericus finally meet the deceased upperclassmen, which included Balder's sister Holder, as they told them how they lost their lives to the evil fairy Maleficent. They then explained how in every world there was a strife born of conflicting beliefs, and it wasn't as obvious as a divide between light and darkness. The upperclassmen departed with the final advice that Ericus and Xehanort should follow their own paths, since it was not up to them to judge. Before departing with the rest of the lost upperclassmen, Odor asked Xehanort for a favor. Xehanort and Ericus returned to Erd and Hermit, to find Bragi and Balder missing, and the four got into the battle with Hades. After fighting and defeating Hades, he cast a group from the underworld into the dark corridors, where Xehanort traveled with Ericus and where Hermit and Erd were lost to the darkness. Master Odin finds Xehanort and Ericus collapsed but alive and brings them back to Scala at Kylum. Xehanort and Ericus meet two years after the events of the main story in a flash forward to play their chess game, with Xehanort explaining his dream to live 14 lifetimes. 13 had put his plan into place to rebuild the world and one to live in the new world, with Ericus replying that his dream is to stay true to light in case anyone found themselves lost to the darkness. In the present day, Master Odin laments the loss of Ericus and Xehanort's classmates before they were interrupted by an attack outside, with Xehanort deducing that Balder was the cause of the other classmates' deaths after falling to the darkness with the loss of his sister Holder. Xehanort and Ericus rush outside to help but have a brief fight with the upperclassmen after finding out they already knew Balder had fallen to darkness. 
The fight was cut short, and Baldur appeared with Xehanort directly sensing darkness in Baldur's heart. Baldur heads to the tower, with the group following, but not before Baldur finds Vor and attacks her. As the upperclassmen attempt to save Vor, all four perish after Baldur's darkness overtakes him and manifests into a physical form, attacking all four as Xehanort and Ericus arrive. Baldur reveals he was trying to summon Kingdom Hearts by first leading Vidar to collect the seven lights, but after Vidar refused to follow through, sacrificing 13 lights to darkness in order to purge the world and having it reborn in darkness. After Ericus and Xehanort defeat Baldur outside the tower, Baldur envelops him and Xehanort into darkness as he tries to convince Xehanort that they're more alike than he realizes. Baldur's heart then reappears as her heart was hiding inside Xehanort's heart after they met in the underworld to try to bring Baldur back to light, or at least finish him. Baldur is then stopped by Master Odin and is finally struck down by Xehanort. A flash forward of one month later shows Xehanort placing flowers on the graves of everyone lost, including Baldur, shortly before Ericus arrives to do the same thing. They have a conversation of how Master Odin decided to hold one more Marker Mastery exam for them before retiring and decide to meet in the tower to play their chess game, as Xehanort tells Ericus to hold on to his dream of light. In a short epilogue, we see a hidden figure saying guess it wasn't him after all, him likely being Baldur. In a flashback of Baldur and Bregi fighting off Severus before Baldur reveals himself by warning Bregi that the darkness was too dense. Bregi then reveals that he's actually Lushu, using Bregi as a vessel and warning Baldur that if he tried to get rid of him, Xehanort would realize he had fallen into the darkness and that he had caused too much trouble to be a vessel. As Baldur runs after Lushu and appears to strike him, we flashback to Lushu saying there's no chosen one yet, but Xehanort could be useful before removing his hood showing Bregi's face and saying it'll be hard to show his face if he's supposed to be buried. In the after credit scene, we return to the figure in the blue robe taking Xehanort from his mom to the Destiny Islands in a scene nine years before the events in the main story, where the figure calls Xehanort a child of Destiny who will save the world from darkness and tells him he'll leave the island once he's strong enough to overcome the darkness. Xehanort shares that he wanted to see the kids from his dreams and describes the Union leaders from Union Cross ending with someone who looked like the hooded figure. The hooded figure reveals that Xehanort can sense what was in the figure's heart and told the story of the Book of Prophecies that it observed in its two lifetimes. When Xehanort got older and shortly before the figure's passing, the figure revealed that they were players from the previous era of Union Cross and hinted that they also observed the events of Missing Link. They leave Xehanort with the belief that he will become Light's master because he was a direct descendant of Ephraimer. So the end of the key saga left us with one of the biggest questions for speculation for the future of the Kingdom Hearts games, which is how exactly will Bloodlines play a role with Keyblade Wilders? It seems that the key saga not only left ample room for Kingdom Hearts Missing Link to answer these gaps, but it also set up much of the foundation for how we can possibly expect the Foretellers and the Master Masters to play a role in Kingdom Hearts 4 and the Lost Master arc. So the key saga was very much a prequel for the Kingdom Hearts story, but it also showed that it will likely add some very important context for this next art. But let me know in the comments below, how much of the key saga did you play or watch and did you enjoy the saga overall? If you want to catch up on the Dark Seeker saga, I'll be linking a recap video of the Dark Seeker saga here in the end screen. And as always, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to this channel if you enjoyed this video and want to watch more Kingdom Hearts content. And if there's anyone who may have questions about what to expect for the upcoming Kingdom Hearts games, be sure to share this video. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time.